Whenever we try to persuade anyone of any particular topic and our opinions on that topic, we tend to present the positive sides of the product. That's just the way human persuasion works. Is it always lying to them to do that? No, I don't think so. Would it be lying if upon further inquiry on their part, we were to tell them deceptive things about the potential downsides of the product or the potential downsides of our opinions? Yes, that would be lying. Okay, so if they ask, I mean, tell them the truth about the, the ways the product could go wrong. But that doesn't mean you always have to disclose everything bad up front. Okay, let me give you a totally um, off the wall personal example. Okay, so um, when I met my lovely wife and began dating her, okay, I did not share all the skeletons in the closet at the beginning. You just don't do that when you're dating somebody. No, you talk about the good things. You have some good times. You share some experiences. You enjoy each other's company. And then later on, you tell the, the, you know, the girlfriend, right? You, later on, you tell the girlfriend about the older brother who's got so many life problems, right? And my older brother, God knows, does. Um, later on, you tell the girlfriend about, you know, your dietary restrictions, right? Um, I told my wife uh, at some time after we were dating that uh, I still had vegetarian tendencies. And she said, you know, if I had known that about you when we just started dating, we would no longer be dating. And, uh, <laughs> right, these sorts of things are not the kinds of things that you tell people when you're trying to pitch something at the outset. But upon further inquiry, as they get to know you and realize, you know, all things have goods and bads, they can see some of the downsides. And that's, I think that's perfectly consistent with principles of uprightness and honesty for you primarily to pitch the positive side of things when you're, you know, initially pitching a product. But let's look at Hagenbuch's reconciliation model on page 377. Okay, um... This is a way that Hagenbuch thinks it is possible to square marketing with Christian principles of truth-telling. Okay, uh, reconciliation, he writes, is fundamentally about restoring, building, and maintaining strong relationships. A Christian vocation understood in the broadest sense is one that supports reconciliation between oneself and God, oneself and others, others and God, and others and others. Okay, I'm reading down a little bit in the text. Marketing seeks to, extur in seeks to encourage exchange that benefits buyers and sellers equally. Unlike a zero-sum game in which one party must lose in order for the other to win, both parties improve their situations through the exchange. This mutually beneficial exchange begins by sellers first identifying, identifying and embracing the needs of buyers and then using that philosophy to guide choices related to things like what is exchanged, where and when the exchange takes place, etc. And then finally at the bottom of that page, exchange is a fundamental human behavior that involves two or more parties each receiving something of value by offering something of value in return. I like that a lot. Um, ideally at its best, Marketing is mutually beneficial. Okay, because the seller receives the money, the profits that he is looking for, and the buyer receives the product that is going to benefit him, improve his flourishing, what he is looking for. Okay, at its worst, marketing is manipulative and is an attempt to use psychological tricks to bring about a product sale. But at its best, it is mutually beneficial. Look, guys, there is a way to avoid going into a field in business where you feel as though you need to employ psychological tricks to sell the product. Okay, and that way is this. Sell products that you believe in and that will actually benefit customers. Okay, if you're selling a product that you don't think is going to benefit the customer, then yeah, you're going to have to use some tricks to try to dupe the customer or deceive the customer into purchasing the product. But if you are, you know, honest to goodness, selling a product that you believe will benefit the customer, then you can do so honestly. And you can pitch the positive sides of the product 
in a sincere way. Full honesty. Okay, um, I would never be able to work in the tobacco industry because I don't believe the product is of any value to the customer. Okay, maybe it gives them an immediate kick, but at a long-term cost that's so great that I think it's impossible to justify. So if I were to work in the tobacco industry, I'd have to pitch the product in all sorts of manipulative ways. Okay, but there's a way to avoid the temptation of deception in marketing, and that is don't go into a field where you have to market a product that you don't believe will be of value to the customer. Okay, if you believe the market, uh, I'm sorry, if you believe the product will be of value to the customer, then it is easy to tell the truth in your marketing efforts. Okay, in the balance of the article, um, Hagenbuch goes through several, as he calls them, misconceptions about marketing. Um, and I guess I would say, to some extent, these are misconceptions, but to some extent, they might be uh, true as characterizations of some aspects of marketing. But let's look at them briefly and just talk, uh, talk about them um, in short order. Okay, on page 378, Hagenbuch asks aloud, why do so many people still believe, as this paper's introduction has suggested, that the discipline of, of marketing, that is, fosters estrangement? The blame does not rest with the fundamental tenets of the discipline, but with the actions that some people and organizations take under the auspices of marketing. Okay, and I think that's a great comment on his part. All of the reputation that marketing has for deception, I think, isn't necessarily a function of something that is inherent to marketing. Rather, it's a function of a lot of marketers. Okay, there are many people operating in this discipline of marketing that aren't doing so in sincere and, and constructive ways. Okay, the first misconception that he lists here on the next page, as he writes, one of the most common indictments of marketing theory is that it supports selling products to people that they do not need. Okay, and we've all had the experience of uh, desperately wanting a product that 10 seconds ago before the advertising pitch we didn't know existed. Okay, um, is that a misconception? Well, I don't know if I'd agree with Hagenbuch that it's a misconception. I think a lot of marketing does encourage people to buy things that they don't need. Um, but I guess I would also say this. Uh, I think customers should have some autonomy to decide what is a need and what is a want. Okay, so I don't think it's the job of the marketer to decide on the customer's behalf. No, actually, you can't afford this product at this time. It's, it's irresponsible for you to you know, be enamored with the product that we're selling here. You need to go and spend your money on basic necessities like groceries rather than this, you know, electronics gadget or something like that. Okay, I don't think that's the job of the, of the marketer. Okay, um, I guess my view on this would be that uh, some marketing probably is manipulative to encourage people to buy things that they don't need, but um, not all marketing is that way by any means. And look, if that bothers you, and, and it does bother me to some extent, go into a field where you are marketing something that, again, is of value to the customer. And it's not just going to be some you know, gadget of no value that's merely a, a materialistic interest. Uh, let me, I've, I've been talking for a little while. Let me pause and ask if there are questions or comments so far or reflections on any of these things. Yeah, yeah. So I just have an example of like, I, I see all the time. So I just want to know, is this just like false advertising? So like, like a burger place, for instance. Sure. Uh, they have this big sign out front that says, best burgers in Texas. You can drive on that same road and see the same sign somewhere else. Is sure. Just false advertising? Are they just trying to get people in there? Or? Um, I would say no in that situation. Uh -huh. um, I think that everybody knows that that's just sort of a hyperbolic sign. It's just there to promote, you know, hype. Okay. Um, if it's a more particular kind of claim, you know, we have been certified as the best burgers in Texas by uh, numerous culinary authorities or something like that, but nobody's actually certified them that, or they made up their own association or something and said, 
you know, that association that they just made up certified their burgers as the best, right? Um, if they make those kinds of claims, that's deceptive. But if it's just like a general purpose claim, best burgers in Texas, I think since, like, I mean, you'd have to be a pretty foolish customer not to know that that's just kind of a general hype claim. Right? I mean, so, and because people know that, I think, I wouldn't consider it deceptive. I think exactly, it'd be hyperbolical. I think it's the best school in the world. No, but it's the right. Best. Yeah. So would it be fair that it would be deceptive if what happened? It would definitely be deceptive. So here's something that companies do. Um, they'll say, uh, our products have been rated number one in our industry by industry authorities. And there will be an asterisk, and then down at the bottom, they'll cite some committee or something. And you know what, if you dig a little bit deeper, that committee was actually formulated by that very company and has done nothing else but cite that particular company as the best, having the best products in the industry. So it's clearly just like a, a total like fixed job, right? So companies will do that. That's deceptive. I mean, that's just lying. Uh, if I were in marketing, I, I would never feel comfortable doing that. Um, but yeah, no, just general purpose claims, I think, are, are fine. Um, again, I, I, I should also qualify everything I'm saying here um, with uh, a lot of this that I'm sharing right now is common sense stuff. The Bible tells us, biblical principles tell us to, uh, you know, be truthful and to be truthful in our business dealings. But the details, the specifics of what counts as truth and what's not, are not listed. So it's up to us to come up with specifics there. And so when I say I wouldn't consider the best burgers in Texas sign to be deceptive, that's me to some extent shooting from the hip, saying this is a common sense way that I would interpret this sign that I think suggests that it's not you know, a systematically deceptive campaign or something like that. That's a long answer, but I hope that helps a little bit. Okay, for sure. Other questions or comments so far? I think it really boils down to that marketing is a tool. And so you can use it poorly and you can use it very well. That is true. That is totally true. Yeah. But I mean, look, guys, marketing is really valuable if you're pitching a product that genuinely helps the customers and the customers will uh, th that will improve their personal flourishing. That's like, this is helpful to people for them to know about this product. A lot of charities that are kind of small, mm -hmm. and like I had a one in my church, mm -hmm. and I was always upset because it had to go down because nobody knew about it and they would never tell anybody about it. And I was mm -hmm. like, if we would have like the sign, if we had a poster, if we had told people, it wouldn't have stopped. Like this is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, sometimes people can become so hyper sensitive and hyper conscious about uh, maybe a, a kind of a a hyper truthfulness that they don't want to ever make a persuasive pitch at all because they feel that you know pitching only or primarily one side of a particular case is deceptive but look look guys it's not deceptive if you are truthful when people ask about the downside pitch the positive side and then tell them the truth when they make further inquiries about, well, what are my negatives here? What could go wrong with this product? You just tell them the truth, you, you know? Like a shared decision. Like, that's what I do when I'm pitching like shows to my friends. So I'm like, here's the bad stuff. I think if you're willing to go through this, there's this good stuff. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Um, and uh, we, we do this all the time in life in general anyway. It's not just in business, right? So, you know, you're at Christmas, right? And grandma serves you the fruitcake. And she says... Like, I want your honest opinion. What do you think of this fruitcake? And you say to her, my honest opinion, Grandma? This is the worst fruitcake I have ever had in my life. No, you don't say that. <laughs> you don't say that. You say, you know, the cherries are just great, Grandma. I'm so glad you added those. Right? We do this all the time in life, right? I mean, and like, it's genuine. You genuinely like the cherries and hate the rest, right? But, uh, you know, that's something that we do all the time is uh, primarily focused on the positives. And if they make further inquiries, that's fine. They can make those inquiries. Okay, um, second misconception later on on the page, marketing theory supports deception in order to get people to buy products. Uh, like I said, I think that that's not necessarily a misconception. Sometimes it is uh, deceptive or semi-deceptive, and I've focused a lot on that topic so far, so let me uh, keep moving. 
Um, third misconception, marketing theory suggests that a given product should be sold to everyone. Okay, um, I guess you could say this is the uh, advertising is annoying criticism, okay? Or advertising is socially degrading criticism. Um, and I mean, yeah, we live in a, an advertising saturated society. Okay, there's, there are advertisements everywhere. Uh, I personally think one reason why streaming services have become so popular is because people are sick of seeing ads on TV and they're willing to pay a subscription fee to avoid seeing ads. Okay, so yeah, people, people do want to avoid ads and people become advertising jaded and advertising, um, you know, just, just kind of uh, immune to a lot of the advertising pitches because they see so much of it. Um, Is it the job of each individual advertiser to try to beautify the society and make it a better place? No, it's their job to pitch the product. If a whole bunch of advertisers operating all together bring about a society that's less beautiful or a society that's degraded or a society that's saturated with excessive ads, that's a general social problem that maybe could be solved at the general social level. But that's not something that each individual advertiser needs to worry about. From a personal perspective as an individual marketer, you should responsibly market your product. And don't worry about whether there are too many billboards along the highway and you know the landscape is ugly as a result, or whether the number of ads that people are seeing for you know, XYZ products are um, causing them to become cynical about life or something like that. I guess that would be my take on that. Individual marketers don't have to worry about that, but maybe collectively as a society, we can worry about that. And maybe there are too many billboards and it does make everything ugly. Um, but that's something that can be solved. We have governments. Society can resolve this. But don't worry about it as an individual marketer, I would say. So I would agree with Hagenberg on this particular misconception. Okay, uh, any comments on that article? Okay, let's take a quick break, and then we're going to come back and look at the other Hagen book article, cover a couple of related issues, and uh, then we will turn to another topic. Okay, let's take a quick break. All right, friends, let's look at the Hagen book article on page 372. Okay, um... And I guess Hagenbuck is entertaining a grab bag of criticisms of uh, marketing in this particular article, and he's defending it against them. Okay, so he's dialoguing with this critic of advertising, this well-known critic, um, Gene Kilborn, who's a consumer advocate. And Kilborn asserts that some advertising, I'm reading here at the beginning of the article, some advertising portrays women in ways that treat them as objects. In addition, there is much more advertising than most of us would like for products such as cigarettes and alcohol. Also, ads for these specific products often do make blatantly false associations, such as healthy people smoke cigarettes. Okay, um, I want to scroll down a bit in this article and look at uh, some of Hagenbuch's comments uh, on page 373. Okay, Hagenbuch writes, marketing is the process, first column on that page, by which a seller encourages a buyer to participate in a mutually beneficial exchange of products, services, or ideas. Okay, and I would agree with Hagenbuch with this qualification, that is marketing at its best. Marketing at its worst is certainly not that. The marketing at its best is certainly, I think, what Hagenbuch describes it as. The marketing concept refers to the seller's desire to satisfy the wants and needs of the buyer by strategically altering elements of the marketing mix, which are often labeled product, place, promotion, and price. Okay, uh, further on, advertising that is well-written and properly targeted therefore often receives a warm reception from consumers, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, um, but the part of the article that I think is most interesting is the part where Hagenbuch actually dialogues with a couple of Kilborn's criticisms. And I mean especially the paragraph that says, finally, Dr. Kilborn purported that advertising is responsible for several social ills. 
Okay, uh, a little further down, eating disorders represent a devastating social problem that we all would like to see eradicated. Do ads that show inordinately skinny models actually cause eating disorders, however? My instincts tell me that certain ads definitely cannot be helping the situation. At the same time, though, one should not overlook other influential factors, such as America's taste for high-calorie foods, aversion to regular exercise, and obsession with physical appearance. Okay, um, I asked the dean if I could do a presentation on Victoria's Secret in this class, and it was nixed. Okay, so I cannot do a PowerPoint presentation on Victoria's Secret in this class. Okay, for obvious reasons. All right. Now, um, but we can all imagine, right, what such a presentation would be like. Victoria's Secret has been a very, very much criticized company because of their marketing approach. And they're sort of the poster child for what's being discussed in this paragraph. And I guess you could describe what's being discussed in this paragraph as um, the criticism is that marketing does psychological harm to customers by creating vulnerabilities in the minds of customers. Okay, how, how does it do so? Well, we all know that uh, sex sells in marketing. Okay, and oftentimes uh, you'll see a particular advertising pitch and you'll wonder to yourself, you know, are they actually selling cars or are they selling sex? It's not clear from the advertising pitch. Okay, um, so we all know that, that this is a very successful way of doing marketing. Statistically, it's very successful. Okay, but um, when companies like Victoria's Secret show a bunch of inordinately skinny models, this creates vulnerabilities in the customers. Customers think to themselves, well, I don't look like that. You know, I must be inferior. You know, and extreme versions of this take the form of eating disorders, right? Or other customers think to themselves, you know, maybe if I just purchased these kinds of clothes, I would look like that, et cetera, et cetera. And so the company has come in for a lot of criticism for this kind of, these kinds of psychological tactics. And um, I thought I would throw it out there just briefly because this is a very common criticism of certain kinds of marketing. Uh, can marketers be faulted for preying upon people's psychological vulnerabilities and or creating such psychological vulnerabilities using tactics, you know, body image tactics, body shaming, right? Uh, these kinds of tactics that are frequently employed. It doesn't just have to be body image tactics, it could be other kinds of tactics, but Victoria's Secret tends to be a poster child for this sort of thing. Can marketers be faulted for preying upon people's vulnerabilities and or creating vulnerabilities in people? What do we think? Is this a legitimate criticism, or can, uh, can marketers be defended from this? No one wants to weigh it on this one. <laughs> Social media and Instagram and YouTube like that also promote, while not advertising, like just people just inherently imitate what they see. Mm -hmm. And what we value is what we're going to imitate. And when we value like these celebrities, you know, Skinny and everything like that. I, I feel like it's not just marketing. I feel like there's a lot more going on. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, and apparel companies are only one aspect of this, right? I'm just highlighting Victoria's Secret because it tends to be a, an extreme, seen as an extreme example of this. But milder versions of it are present throughout the advertising world and not just in advertising, but all over social media, et cetera. Yeah. It's, 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 it's like it's psychological work. It's like it's, our, it's almost getting to consumers, maybe. Mm -hmm. How okay. marketable is that? Okay, all right, good comment. Others, anybody else? Can marketers be faulted? Like, is this something that, is it a moral fault in marketers? Or is it something that is, is justifiable, something that's legitimate? I mean, after all, they're just trying to sell clothing. And how do you sell clothes without, you know, showing good-looking people in the clothes? That's one, one pitch that could be made on their behalf. I think it depends on, like, the intent of the marketer. Because obviously, you can't tell their intent at all, but it's just like, if they know, like, for example, people they struggle with body issues and it's just like but they they like you don't care if that helps us sell our product like if they prey on mm -hmm. people that are like that then like that's a problem mm -hmm. because Victoria's Secret obviously like stuff that they wear like they want you know good models like really skinny bodies and stuff like that and it's just they're just doing that for profit because everyone has insecurities because sometimes it may not like sometimes it's not bodies like mentally like emotions, oh sure like, sure everything's yeah. like everyone gets offended by something 
Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. is based on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, good comment. So the comment is probably the justifiability of the tactic depends on the intent of the marketer in pursuing the tactic. Okay, that's a good comment. If the intent is to find and, uh, and create and identify and, and promote vulnerabilities, that is a problem. But if the intent is just to sell product. Let's say they're yeah. primarily targeting children. I think mm -hmm. a lot of people tend to say it. Draw the line at children and yeah. say they're, they're, they can't defend themselves against, yeah. against such things. Right? But it's a self-product. Yeah, and, and I mean, like, to be perfectly honest, um, for some kinds of products, like, how could you market it without doing the kinds of things that the apparel companies do, right? So, um, like, how do you market Fruit of the Loom products without showing people in Fruit of the Loom products? I mean, do you just kind of, like, I, I don't know. Do you just, like, show happy people doing something else? That's how they market Viagra, is they just show an old couple in a hot tub squeezing hands, right? Um, right, do you... <laughs> Been successful. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, so to some extent, <laughs> the marketers are are boxed in by their product, <laughs> but to some and, and, and you know they have to solve a certain way. I should just dismiss class right now. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, but to some extent, maybe they are responsible uh, for the way that they pitch that product and. Um, and if they do intend to create psychological vulnerabilities, that's a problem. Okay, um, I have a few minutes left, and we are still a little bit behind. Today was supposed to be the day when uh, we worked on uh, the first, mo uh, first part of our accounting uh, ethics module. Okay, I'm going to give it a little bit of a start here at the end of our class section today, but know that it's just a taste, like tip of the iceberg of accounting ethics. We're doing uh, individual field modules now. Okay, we've already done management. We just did marketing. We're about to enter an accounting ethics segment. Okay, we'll do a finance ethics uh, segment uh, shortly after this. Okay, I want to start by just saying a few things uh, about the problem in accounting. And I'm going to be basing this on the Stewart article in, on page 325. So we'll call this just a problem in accounting ethics. This is the heart of the problem in accounting ethics when it comes to moral issues. So now we're on accounting. Yes, yes, yes. So we've been doing a marketing ethics module. Uh, we're still a little bit behind in our class materials because of the freeze week. But uh, we're almost caught up, and today um, I'm trying to finish it up with about 10 or 12 minutes on accounting ethics. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, by the way, I should say that compared to marketers, accounting ethic, accountants, accountants have a pretty good ethical reputation. Okay? Uh, marketers tend to have the, and I don't want to, like, do I have marketing majors here? I don't want to diss my marketing majors. Um, you guys can be the change that needs to happen in this field. But accountants tend to have a better ethical reputation than marketers. Um, but there is a problem in accounting ethics. Okay, and the problem can be illustrated pretty easily on the board. Let me illustrate it for you. Management. We'll just take a proverbial public company, although the same could be um, said of private companies. Management hires accountants. And I'm going to talk especially about auditors here. So they could be internal or external auditors. In part, in order to sort the books and help management better understand what's going on in their own company. But in part, in order to obtain financing. We'll call this financiers. Okay, so in any public company, the accountants serve a crucial role. Okay, management hires the accountants 
in part to sort the books, organize the structure of the company financially. In part, though, in order to inspect things as a referee would do, as an impartial, independent party would do, and then to inform the financiers that this is, in fact, what the company's finances look like. Okay, that's the core relationship that exists in any public company and private companies as well in terms of the relationship between management, auditors, and financiers. Financiers can take different forms. Uh, they might be credit providers. These could be bond providers, warrant providers. They could be equity providers, so maybe they're shareholders. Like ordinary retail shareholders could function as financiers. If they purchase, if you purchase shares in Pepsi, uh, not on, on the secondary market, but as part of a, an IPO or as part of a, a secondary public offering or something like that, then you're functioning as a financier to provide the company with money. Okay, now these arrows so far represent information flow. I want to add to this, uh, this diagram a little bit to talk about the flow of finance and the money. Okay, if you want to understand in any kind of business why people do what they do, you need to follow the money. The financiers in return provide management with money. Again, this might be investment banks, this could be just bond providers, credit providers of any kind, this could be equity providers. And in fact, in this relationship, there is another monetary connection that is between management and auditors. Okay, and this is the problem. This is the fundamental problem in accounting ethics. I just described it right here, okay? The problem is management pays the accountants. That's the problem. Okay, um, some of us are athletes, yes? Athletes, what sport? That's right. Um, what sport? Soccer. soccer. I'll take soccer. It's an easier way to describe this problem. So we're part of the Southland Conference in soccer, yes? No, are we not? Yeah. Oh, really? We're part of a different conference in soccer? Yeah, that's what I'm oh, okay. All right, well, we're a Southland Conference in basically everything else, I think. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. All right, um, well, let's, let me pick an independent sport, football, right? Okay, so... We are part of the Southland Conference in football. And we have referees that referee our football games back before COVID. Who pays the referees? The league office pays the referees. Yeah. If we as a school in, like directly pay the referees, that would be a problem, right? At least I hope we would see it as a problem. It would be a problem because it would color their perception of the game. It would alter the way they see the game. Okay, and basically what's going on in business, the problem in accounting ethics is that the teams are paying the referees. That's the core problem. The teams are paying the referees. It's not the league office that's paying the referees, it's the teams. Now, there are great referees out there. Account I've known many accountants who are honest and who've been paid by management and still uh, they reject management's way of seeing things and they provide an independent perspective and they push back against management and they say, no, we're not going to actually sign off on this particular rendering of your financials. We want to see better accountability here. Okay, and I've seen, I've seen that happen a lot, okay? But there is an incentive in the relationship between management and the accountants for the accountants to see things management's way. And the incentive is because management pays the accountants, the auditors in this case. Um, there have been different solutions that have been proposed for resolving this. So one solution that's been proposed is that the government 
which would be sort of like the league office, the government could pay the referees here. But that would have its own problems. Government tends to slow things down. Government tends to be inefficient. And government can be just as corrupt as business. So whereas businessmen might be corrupt in trying to influence auditors for their own perspective to see things their way, government regulators can also be corrupt in trying to influence auditors to see things their way. So because of those kinds of problems, that solution has never really caught on. And yet management needs auditors and accountants more generally because they need to obtain financing. And the auditors provide management with a kind of a, a seal of approval so that they can then go out to the public and say, look, our books have been inspected by XYZ accounting firm, and you can trust that our financials are what they appear to be because we have obtained independent confirmation that this is the case. Okay, so that's a really important role. Management needs that. Companies need that in order to survive and uh, to obtain the financing that they need. It is in the interests of management to have their books regularly inspected so that the public can know and trust the financials. One other proposal that has been made is that the financiers should pay the auditors. Um, maybe every time you buy shares in a company, you can pay a fee, add it to your trading commission or something like that. Pay a fee that will actually go to pay the salaries of company auditors. But this has never really caught on because a lot of people don't really like paying extra fees when they're shareholders. And a lot of people uh, these days, the way the stock market works, I mean, a lot of people don't see owning shares in a company really as being an owner of a company at all. They just see it as being owning shares temporarily in some electronic thing that's flitting across their screen. They don't see the connection to a, a deeper underlying company. So for that reason, this, uh, this proposal of the financiers paying the auditors has never really caught on either. What we have is a system where the teams pay the referees, management pays the um, accountants, and the accountants have a natural incentive to see things management's way. Okay, and I am going to leave you with one last thought, and that is that I have personally known and also read about more generally many, many, many honest accountants who are paid by management and who refuse to see things management's way or or maintain just their personal independence and professionalism. Okay, and I highly respect that. Uh, but if you look at big scandals like Enron, Enron occurred because Arthur Anderson was being paid by Enron. And it's not just those kinds of high profile scandals, it happens on a smaller basis all the time every day. When management, when you pay somebody, there's an expectation that the party you are paying will cooperate and we'll see it your way or we'll approach the topic from your perspective. Okay? Just as a, an FYI. Comments or thoughts on the, um, the fundamental problem in accounting ethics? Any reflections? Yeah, so um, private companies need financing as well. Um, and they, since they don't go public in the equity markets, they typically obtain their financing from credit providers, maybe banks or other sources of credit, credit unions even. Um, and because of that, they need accountants also to provide those banks with uh, inspections of their books that have been, um, you know, the, like appropriately cleaned and given them a seal of approval. So although this is most easily understood for public companies because of the whole internal external auditor distinction, private companies need the same kind of accountant work in order to obtain financing. They just don't get their financing from the equity markets. Good. Any other questions?
All right, you guys go in peace. Um, tomorrow there will be an exam uh, that will be available all day. It's an open book exam. Please remember that you can use the full three hours to take your exam and uh, you know look up the materials uh, to the